too. Uh, we got great speakers lined up. We've got, you know, uh, you know, people from our church, pastors and others that you're going to hear from. Uh, Mike Terugiano um, is a vineyard pastor that many of you know. He's going to share one weekend. Craig Simonian, who's the vineyard pastor in Morris Plains, is going to share another weekend. So there's going to be great stuff going on throughout the month of July. I'll come back and you'll say, Phil, take some more time off. That was really good hearing from some other people. So it's going to be good. So Father's Day. Uh, we're going to honor the fathers in a moment, but I actually chose a short video that I thought kind of captured something important for us to think about on Father's Day. So check this out. This is slightly intimidating. <laughs> Dad, what about me makes you proud? Oh, man. Um... Dad, what about me makes you proud? Dad, what about me makes you proud? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Dad, what about me makes you proud? Did I have to answer that one? Yes. <laughs> Just about everything that you do. You're loving. You're funny. If I could go on and on. <laughs> and what makes me proud about you is you just being yourself. I had trouble with alcohol. It was actually an intervention. Even with all the other people there, you were the, the real reason that I made the decision to go into the treatment center that I did. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're helpful. Yeah. You forgot the funny part. <laughs> your attention to uh, hygiene. <laughs> Dad, I am grateful to you for choosing to stay when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, Why am I crying? <laughs> At the time when I'm graduating and I'm packing up and leaving, then it's really going to hit me. And I think about a time when if you're not around, like that would be awful. <laughs> but like you're the you're the person that would always laugh. Dad, I'm grateful because we didn't know how long you were going to be with us, so we're so happy that you're still here. Dad, I'm proud of you for knowing that the most important thing was to just give your kids so much time. I've always been impressed by you. You made it easy. Thanks. I miss having the chance to just check in with you. I miss your sketchbooks. I love you. I love you too. You got it. We don't say it enough. Mm. Hey. <laughs> I love you, Dad. <laughs> it doesn't compute until they're gone. <laughs> so tell them now. What a weird standing so close to you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you know, I just, there were a couple videos that I, that I was checking out, and I just thought there was something really powerful about this, to just remember that we communicate to one another from the heart, you know, to our dads and dads to our kids, that we don't just take things for granted, that we express and say what's on our heart. So we want to honor the dads who were here. And so all dads, if you would please stand up. Fathers, stand up. And if there's a bun in the oven, you are a father. So stand up. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to say, listen, I'm actually surprised to say, for the first time in many years, we actually have a good Father's Day gift for you. So guys, come in, start giving out some gifts. We got, you guys are getting our first new North Jersey Vineyard coffee mugs there. We've, we've tried, I mean, through the years, you know, it's easy with the moms. You take the photos, you give the roses. We've tried, like, we remember one year we gave all the dads screwdrivers, and not the drinks, that might have been different, but, you know, actual screwdrivers and books and whatnot, but I'm a coffee drinker drinker so this is a cup of you know it's like big enough it can hold a good cup of coffee just remain standing I we just want to bless you we want to pray for you and so guys let's all pray for for all the dads who were standing here Lord God in Jesus name we lift up every father of God that's here Whatever stage of life they're in, God, whether they're new dads, whether their kids have grown up and moved on and uh, moved out of the house, whatever it is, God, we pray for a blessing. And Lord God, we thank you that we can proclaim 
that you are a good, good father. And Lord, that what we're trying to do as dads, God, is we're trying to model your heart. And so, God, I pray that you would fill all of us fathers right now with the Father's love, with the Father's heart, that you would give us, God, your strength, that you would give us endurance and perseverance and and joy and hope and love, God, that we would be able to be faithful to the calling that you've given to us. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we center our life on you. God, I pray that you would help us, God, to always let our children know that we love them, that we're for them, and God, that, that first and foremost, God, we, we have committed our lives to you. And Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would bring blessing. Lord, that you cause your face to shine upon every household that's represented here. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us up so that we can do your work, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yay, dads. God bless you guys. I don't know what we're going to give you next year, but this year was an all right gift. So, uh, hey, there's um, something that Epcot Center had done for, did for a number of years. They had this thing called the Legacy Center. I got a picture of it here. And this Legacy Center, what it was is that you could pay money and you'd give money and, you know, if you gave a little bit of money, there'd be a little teeny tiny picture. If you gave a lot of money, there'd be a big picture, maybe even a big slab. And your picture would be put on granite. And the promise was, is this is going to be here forever. This legacy center will be here even when the zombie apocalypse comes or whatever. This will will still be here. And so half a million people paid money to have their picture put in Epcot Center. And I just got to wonder, like, why? Like, why would you do that just so that, like, strangers can see your picture with, you know, half a million other pictures? And I think it really speaks to something that's inside all of us that we want to leave a legacy. That there's something in us that we want to leave a mark. That we want the, the, the world to be different because we've been in it. And all fathers, we, that, is, that is at the essence, the heart of what we want to see happen with our children, with our families. Is that we want to leave a mark. We want to leave a legacy. But it's not just fathers. All of us want to do that. That is something that is deep within our heart. And so what I want to talk about today on Father's Day, but I think it's relevant for all of us, is how do we do that? How do we live lives in such a way that leave a legacy? And, and I, was, I was thinking about kind of the, the tone and tenor of my preaching. And, uh, and one of the things that I do a lot, and if you guys are, you know, come here on a regular basis, you, you know, that I'll talk about Jesus being in the center of our lives and how important it is that we put him first and that how God started a work in you and he's going to finish it and that work is conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. But I wonder if we talk enough about some of the specifics. Like rather than just like some ethereal thing of like, all right, what does it mean that I'm becoming like Jesus? What are the character traits that he wants to develop and form in our lives? What is our life to look like? And how can... Following Jesus and becoming more like him, specifically thinking about some character traits, that can help us leave a legacy. That can help us have the impact that we want to have. And so I want to talk this morning about something that I think is really important and we probably don't talk about it enough. What does it mean to live lives of integrity? What does it mean to live lives of integrity? Gallup has done this poll every year for many, many years where they ask people, ask Americans, what, um, who, what American do you uh, admire the most? And there was a 40-year period where the same name topped the list every year for 40 years. And that's kind of amazing. And it was, I think it was like people who were alive now. So it wasn't like Abraham Lincoln or John George Washington, but people who are alive now. And the person who for 40 years was at the top of the list was Billy Graham. I have a picture here of Billy Graham. That's pretty amazing. And, you know, like all of, you know, most of us of a certain age, we know Billy Graham. Maybe some of you younger people don't know who Billy Graham is because he's still alive. He's about 95, but he's been retired. He's not the same kind of public persona that he was. But for a 40-year period, this guy was famous. I mean, not just in the church. He was famous everywhere. He would give crusades all over the world where hundreds of millions, I mean, maybe even like a billion people saw Billy Graham live because he would, like there were, there were a number of cities where the largest, the largest gathering of human beings was at a Billy Graham crusade or a Billy Graham event. Billy Graham uh, advised, was the spiritual advisor, not just for a photo op, but actually like when nobody was looking for every president from JFK to Clinton. 
Like, it didn't matter what party they were from. They would get Billy on the phone or get Billy to the White House to help, help uh, him guide them, guide them through some difficult things. And I, and I think the reason that he had such an impact was the incredible life of integrity that he lived. It was just, it's rare. Because Billy Graham was in the public eye for so long, there was never a scandal. There was never anything improprietous with a woman. There was never any funny business with the money. Billy Graham actually had a salary from the Billy Graham Association of, I think I'd read, like towards the end of his life, it was like $75,000 a year. Now, that's a good salary. But he had sold books, the, like the written books that, that sold millions of copies. But he'd give all that money back to the ministry. And he lived simply on $75,000 a year. And the integrity, too, of his message, his message for his whole life was the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was it. He didn't let it get co-opted or corrupted by anything else. It was just the gospel. And so people are like, wow, that's rare. 40 years in a row. And so integrity has this huge impact. So what does it mean for us to live lives with integrity? I think it, it means three things. And you might say, well, what about this or what about that? But I think we'd all agree that these three things are essential elements of what it means to live with integrity. One is that you live a life where you tell the truth, you keep your word, and you do what you say you believe. That if we do these three things, now listen, we all, you know, we live with our eyes open. We know what the world is like. If you do this, you will be a weirdo. Right? I mean, you will be rare if you tell the truth, keep your word, do what you say you believe. And so let's break it down. I want to talk about it. I want to get a little bit specific about this. Proverbs 17, 7, when it comes to telling the truth, it says, eloquent lips are unsuited to a godless fool. How much worse lying lips to a ruler? Now, the word here for ruler doesn't necessarily mean a king. It uh, can mean anyone who has any level of authority. Now, everything rises and falls on leadership. I absolutely believe that. Whether you're talking about a church, whether you're talking about the marketplace, whether you're talking about a family whether you're talking about government. And so we live at a time right now, because what this Bible verse says is that leaders need to tell the truth. And so we have a crisis of leadership in our country. We have a crisis of leadership at every level because people don't tell the truth. And see, what happens is if you're trying to lead, whatever it is, your business, your family, your whatever, if you're trying to lead and you don't tell the truth, then people can't trust you. And if they can't trust you, then they can't follow you. And there's a breakdown in leadership. I think there's almost, I can almost say that we have a crisis in government. When you look at this, like, you know, the polls that come out about the incredibly low level of trust that the American public has in Congress, I think now it's negative. I don't know if that's possible, but it's really close. To, it's like as low as it can be. Look at the last presidential election that we had. And so much of it was about, can, can these people be trusted? And... And so we need, to realize, <laughs> we need to realize how important it is. But here's the thing that we need to think about. Because, listen, when I was a kid, I remember I, I all of a sudden had this, you know, I was, a, I was a knucklehead of a kid. God bless my parents. But I remember having this realization that, like, oh, I can just kind of do whatever I want. And then if I lie about it, then I won't get into trouble. Is that just me? Did anyone else ever? I mean, I kind of think there was a moment where that kind of dawned on me. And I was like, oh, this is a cool thing I've discovered. And, and so the, the, what happens, the reason, the reason that we tell lies, the majority of the time, is because there's a consequence that we want to avoid. There's something that we did that we don't want to pay the consequences for. We don't follow the wisdom of Norma. Now, Norma could write a book someday, The Wisdom of Norma, as long as I've known her, which now has been a long time. She, one of her favorite phrases is, if you don't want people to know about it, don't do it. That's good words to live by. But, uh, but we, don't, we don't follow the wisdom of Norma. And so we lie. But what we need to understand is I believe that it is a greater consequence for us to be caught in a lie than it is for us to deal with whatever it is we did. That if we say, if we do something that we're ashamed of or that we shouldn't have done or we get called on the carpet for, we could say, I'm sorry, forgive me, I messed up. And, and I think people will receive that. It might create some problems. But it is so much better than being caught in a lie and having it be known that you're a liar. If you have that in your life, if people say, ah, his lips are moving, but I don't know if he's telling the truth, that is a really hard thing to just try to lead, to have relationships, for there to be trust, and it makes it a lot harder for us to legal leave a legacy. And so we're committed to telling the truth. We're committed to keeping our word. Proverbs 25, 14 says, like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of gifts never given. 
Proverbs has a lot of great wisdom like that. And uh, Solomon, who wrote this, it was, a, you know, Israel's a desert climate. And so they needed water. They always, you know, they needed water. And so they didn't have, like, a weather app. They didn't have uh, the weather channel that they could turn to. What they would do is that they would see, oh, look, there are clouds coming in and the wind is picking up. We're going to get some rain. Put out the buckets. This is really good. And it says that, like, if, but there, if, if it was just clouds and the rain never came, that's like someone who makes a promise but doesn't follow it through. And have you ever failed to keep a promise? I mean, obviously, all of us have failed to keep a promise. We do it in a lot of different ways, but we don't think about the implications of it. One of the things that Christians do all the time is when we hear the struggle that somebody's going through and we say, I'll pray for you. Really? Are you going to pray for that person? Or is that just kind of the Christian equivalent of like, good luck, or I'll keep a thought for you? But, you know, God convicted me a few years ago because I'll say that, you know, I would say that a lot. I'm in a lot of contexts where that's an appropriate thing to say. And it was like, well, wait a minute. Am I, if, I'm, if I say I'm going to pray for them, am I going to pray for them? Or we make promises like I'll return it as soon as I'm done with it. Or how about don't worry, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> right? What about, you know, I'll be home by 6 p.m. Or, or I'll have it for you by the end of the day. Or what about this one? I promise to love, honor, and cherish you till death do us part. See, this is all essential in if living with integrity and leaving a legacy. Jesus said this. He said, let your yes be yes in Matthew 5, 37. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Wouldn't it be great if you could be known as a person that when you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it? You know what, this church, as the church grows and whatnot, there's a lot of more like moving parts. My role, my function in the church changes all the time. And one of the things, whether it's a, a staff member or a volunteer, when there's someone who you know when they say, don't worry, I'm going to do this, and you know it's going to happen, that is such a joy to me that I don't have to like remind them or follow up or the deadline's coming and like wonder if this is going to actually be done. You'll stand out if you're someone that if you say yes, you mean yes. You know, what the number one source of resentment in kids is unkept promises. And they do polls and they ask kids, what are you resentful about? Unkept promises from their parents is at the top of the list. Now, I have broken promises to my kids. When we break promises to our kids, it's not because we stop loving them or we're telling them this and we're like, oh, I have no intention of doing this. It's that we mean to do it. You know, oh, we'll do this in the summer and next week I'll take you here or we'll do this or we'll do that. Then life happens, responsibilities happens, and we think, oh, I can't do that, but it's no big deal. But it actually is a big deal. It is a big deal to our kids when we make promises uh, that we don't keep. And so the third part of this is that you do what you say you believe. That whatever it is you say you believe, you actually do it. So, you know, uh, the definition for a hypocrite is one who falsely professes to be virtuously or religiously inclined, one who pretends to have feelings or beliefs of a higher order than his real ones, hence generally a dissembler, pretender. Now, living what we believe, that what, what that doesn't mean, I don't want you to feel that this is like some impossible thing. It doesn't mean that for the rest of your life, if you say, I want to be like Jesus, and I want to be holy, and I want to follow God, that if you ever sin, you're a hypocrite. It doesn't mean that, because this side of eternity, we're all going to mess up, we're all have sinned, all, you know, fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean that, but what I think it does mean is two things. That the first is that for the people in our life, we need to be real with them. We need to be honest about our struggles and our shortcomings. We need to be someone who it's easy to say, I'm sorry. It's easy to ask for forgiveness. And that for us as Christians, like if you have accepted Jesus Christ and you understand that like this whole deal is about forgiveness, right? That what gives us right standing with God is that we have received the forgiveness of God because we're all sinners. So it should not be hard for us to say, I'm sorry, I have sinned. We should be aware that we are sinners. We're going to mess up. Are you quick with that? Or are you trying to keep up some image? Are you like, you know, I, I'm going to say something to show how old I am. Remember Fonzie, the Fonz? Couldn't say I'm sorry. You know, don't, don't be like the Fonz in a lot of ways. And many of you were like, who is this old guy? What is he talking about? But, <laughs> but there's another part to this. There's another part. Like, be willing, be vulnerable, be aware, be honest about your struggles, your shortcomings. The second part is this. 
make sure that we are looking to express our values, the things that we say really matter to us in the real world. For example, if you say that you care for the poor, is there evidence in your life that you care for the poor? Are there actual poor people somewhere in the world who have you go and care for them? Don't just say that you care for them and not do anything about it. Don't say that you forgive. Don't say, yes, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. When all the people around you know that you're not living that out, that there are people that you've been holding deep-seated bitterness and hatred against for many, many years. Don't say that you want to be loving and you want to lift up people and, you know, I just want to love. Let's, you know, let's just love while you're gossiping and trashing the people who are in your life. Don't say that you want to know God without carving some real time. Don't say God is the priority in my life and I want to know him without carving out real time in your life to get to know God better. Don't say that you want to be a worshiper and you want to worship God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and then, you know, get to worship time 20 minutes late and not be able to worship God. You're, you know, people notice that. Your family notices that. Or to not actually engage and worship God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That the things that are in our hearts that we actually seek to express, that we seek to live out. Now, Psalm 101, verse 2 says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. Now, the reality for all of us is we know this life of integrity, it is hardest to do in the family because your family knows you. They know all of your flaws and all of your weaknesses. They see it all. That's why I love that the psalmist here doesn't say, I will conduct the affairs of my house with blameless actions. It says a blameless heart. That's why it's so important to let your kids know, let your spouse know, let the people in your life see your heart, that you love them that you prioritize them, that you're for them. Like we saw in the video, look for opportunities to say it, to express it, that they can see your heart. Let them know, look for opportunities to express from your heart. I love Jesus, I'm trying to serve with Jesus and serve Jesus and sometimes I fall short, but this is my heart, this is what I wanna see happen. Because I think it's possible, it's hard, but it's possible for us to be able to live according to this great definition of success, which is having those who know you the best respect you the most. If they can see your heart. Not, you don't have to be perfect, but can they see your heart? It's easy to impress people from a distance. And yes, this is hard. And the last thing I'd want to do on this Father's Day is kind of put some kind of condemnation trip on you. But see, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit, because he loves us, will convict us. And conviction is totally different from condemnation. Condemnation is like, oh man, I have no integrity. I'm a man. The Holy Spirit will come and say, hey, I'm working in your life. I can make you more truthful. I can make you someone who keeps his promises. I can make you someone who actually lives out what it is they believe. And as you do that, you don't have to be like, you know, beautiful or a genius or have this personality that is just, you know, effervescent. Anyone can live a life of integrity. Anyone can live this kind of a life if we let the Holy Spirit do it. And what I want you to think about is how essential this is to everything you want to accomplish in your life. How key it is to have that impact, to leave that legacy. And don't be discouraged. But have the attitude that Paul had in Philippians 3.12, where he said, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. That we would all have that attitude to say, you know what? I need to grow in my integrity. And so I'm going to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And we're intentional about it, that we give ourselves to it. Because we've got to think, you know, what is it that we're giving ourselves to? Because we give ourselves to a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there that we make really important in our life, but stuff that's not going to last. Stuff that doesn't have eternal significance. We give ourselves to money, to entertainment, to fitness, and they can all be okay things. But I want to suggest that first and foremost, we give ourselves to Jesus, that we give ourselves to him and we cooperate with him in building things in our lives that will last for all of eternity. Because Jesus said this in John 6, 27, do not work for food that spoils, 
but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Don't make your life about things that won't last because power will not last. Pleasure will not last. Stuff will not last. Likes on your Facebook or your Instagram will not last. These things don't last. But we have an opportunity to build our life, to leave an impact, a legacy on things that last. So what lasts? Truth lasts. Truth lasts. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking what we would call the Old Testament, but for him it was the Bible. He was kind of writing the New Testament with everything that came out of his mouth. But he's talking about the Old Testament. And he said, this is truth. This is truth. And heaven and earth will pass away before like the dot of an I or the cross of a T passes away. Jesus said this in, in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never disappear. See, let me just say this as clearly as I can as your pastor. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. You have, don't just say, okay, well, Phil will preach or someone will preach and there'll be lots of Bible verses. No, read the Bible. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Sit down in your own little quiet place and read the Bible. And you know what? Maybe you don't know where to start or what to do. People can help you with that. There's reading plans. There's websites you can go to. But when you sit down to read the Bible, say, Holy Spirit, Help me understand this truth. Help me understand this so I can get it into my life, so I can build my life on something that will last. And here's the good news. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. The job of the Holy Spirit is to lead us into truth, is to remind us of what's important so we can apply it to our life. And so I promise you, if you sit down with the Bible as part of your life and you say, Holy Spirit, teach me, God will change your life. Because you'll be building your life on something that lasts, something that's eternal. So that's the first thing. The second thing is people. People will last. Every single human being, although what is it up to now? Seven billion plus people on this planet. From the moment they're conceived, they become eternal. They're going to live on forever. And so that's why the way that we treat people is so important. That's why, you know, I remind us that we, and it's, you know, it's hard, but we have to remember that everyone has unsurpassable worth because they're going to last forever, every single person. What the Bible says about every human being is that they will last forever and some will last forever with Jesus in the kingdom of God. That there's going to be a day that Jesus will come back and when he comes back, that he is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And that's, you know, it's really exciting because what that means is that what God's going to do when Jesus sets up his kingdom, when he sets up his kingdom, he's going to take the physical earth and the spiritual heaven and he's going to merge the two. And so there's going to be this like combination of heaven and earth. It's going to be this like whole new thing. And he's not only going to do that with the world, he's going to do that with us. Jesus was like the first of human, humanity 2.0. He had a resurrection body. He had a spiritual body. And so this merging of the physical and the spiritual will happen not only where we live, but will happen inside of us. And, you know, I could talk about all sorts of great implications of that. Like, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to fly and some other really cool stuff. But that's, you know, that's awesome. And what, what also what the Bible says and what I want us to think about is that we will either live forever in the kingdom of God, or we will live forever, forever separated from the kingdom of God in a place called hell. And maybe you might say, well, wait, hold on, wait a minute, Phil. You believe in hell? That sounds kind of medieval. I mean, come on, hell? What are you talking about? Yes, I believe in hell. I believe in hell because Jesus believes in hell. Jesus talked about hell a lot, and Jesus actually, he created everything, so he knows a lot more about stuff like that than I do. So I believe what Jesus said. And Jesus said this. He said this in Matthew 25, 41. He said, one day he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And what the Bible says is that hell was never meant to be a place that human beings would be in. It was made for Satan and his rebellious demons that went with them to kind of quarantine them, get them out of the way so they can't like mess stuff up like they've been doing. 
But the Bible is also very clear, though, that even God desires that all men come to repentance. According to 2 Thessalonians 1.9, talking about some people, it says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord in His glorious might. That's what the Bible says. That, that there's some people who are going to live forever in the kingdom of God and others will be shut out from the presence of God and His glorious might. I like what C.S. Lewis says about this, and C.S. Lewis says everything so much better than I ever could. He said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is opened. That's what I believe, you know, said so well by C.S. Lewis. That, uh, that, that the, the drama of the ages is, are we going to say to God in this life, thy will be done? God, we see that you're valuable. We see that you matter, God. We see that there's sin and we need you to deal with it. And so I accept you, Jesus, and I'm going to center my life on you, God. Thy will be done in my life. And God takes us with all of our imperfections and everything else and he says, your name is written in the book of life. But then there are others who all throughout their life say, no. I don't want God's will. I don't even like God. I don't want anything to do with God. My will be done. And then at the end of that life, God will not impose himself upon that person. God will say, okay, all of your life you said, you said, you know, my own will be done. Now that is what I say to you. Your will be done. And so let me ask this in talking about leaving a legacy. Because the greatest legacy that we can leave, yes, we live with integrity. And yes, you know, it builds a legacy and for those who are around us. But the greatest legacy that we can live is for God to use us in some way to change somebody's eternal destiny. For God to use us as individuals and a church to somehow help someone say to God, thy will be done and change completely their eternal destiny. So is there anyone whose eternal destiny has been changed in part by something you've done. Like, hey, we can't talk about leaving a legacy without talking about that. Is there someone who's going to be in heaven? Because maybe what happened was, you know, you were living your life as a servant and you were kind of, you know, saying, hey, how can I help? And people saw something different about your life and they said, man, what, what's different about you? And you had an opportunity to tell them. Or maybe, uh, maybe you, you were a witness for Jesus. And we say like, hey, God calls us to be his witnesses, not his lawyers. We don't have to convince anybody of anything. Just tell people what Jesus did for you. Tell people, hey, you know what? Man, my life was broken and Jesus came in and he started putting me back together again. He helped me get over addictions. He saved my marriage. He got me through this really hard time. He gave me strength to keep going. And people will say, wow, I, could, I need Jesus to do that for me. Or maybe you had an opportunity to actually explain to someone, here's, here's salvation. Here's what Jesus did for us. Here's how you appropriate to your life. Let me pray for you. Or you had a chance to pray for someone who was in pain. Let me pray for you right now in the hopes that God would break in and heal them and they would realize there's a living God. Have you ever invited someone to church? Let me just say, you know, a little bit kind of behind the scenes. What we're trying to do here is we are trying to cooperate with you. We want to be a part of the drama of the ages. We want to see more and more and more people say yes to God. And we want to cooperate with you. That is, you're being a witness, as you're saying, can I pray for you, as you're having conversations, that you can invite them to come to church. And we want to have an environment and an atmosphere that is alive with the Holy Spirit. There are lots of people who pray all throughout the week, God, let your presence come when we gather together to worship. Lord, during the worship time, may your, may your presence move and work. Even Grimaldi, as he led us this morning, he stopped and he said, God, work right now. God does. He's faithful. In the messages that I preach and that others preach, we seek to preach to both the churched and the unchurched at the same time, to those who know Jesus and those who don't. I actually, I travel around the country and I do stuff for pastors. I do the seminar and one of the things, one of the parts of my seminar is how to preach to the church and the unchurched at the same time. I don't think it's that hard actually because I think the reality is everybody needs more Jesus and so we lift up Jesus and then we just kind of help people figure out how does this apply to you. We're trying to make an environment where, where we as a church can cooperate with you to help see your friends say yes to God. So who have you invited to come to church with you? Are you praying for God to use you to leave this lasting legacy that because of something in your life 
that someone will be influenced to say yes to God. And let me just, you know, let me just end this now um, by giving an opportunity that if there's anyone here, if you're here this morning and you have never said yet to God, thy will be done, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And see, here's what happens. All it takes is for us to very simply say, God, yes, we open up our hearts. God, please come in. And then God does all the rest. And all of your sins are forgiven. And now, instead of God living outside of you, God lives inside of you. He gives you the Holy Spirit. And you begin to get to know God, and you experience His strength and His comfort and His truth. It begins to really grow in your life. And what the Bible says is that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Your name, from the moment that you say yes to Jesus, Jesus said your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you don't have to worry about death. You don't have to worry about where you'll be for all of eternity. The Bible says it's so incredible. It's like you're born again. It's you're, you're a new creation. And if you've not done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning because that is the most, deci- the most important decision that you will ever make. And I believe leaving any kind of a legacy begins with that. So let's pray.